So, um, yeah, you know the drill. I'm going to uh, refer straight over now to, uh, on, my uh, on my left, Nancy, do you want to kick us off? Sure. I'm Nancy Stagliano, the CEO of True North Therapeutics. True North is a small biotechnology company based in South San Francisco that is developing its first drug for the treatment of rare autoimmune diseases. We hope that with this, this initial therapeutic that we are able to address a number of neglected diseases that all share the same biology. Can I give you an example? Please do. <laughs> so I am a person who's never liked the cold. In fact, I avoid cold climates like the plague. Probably won't fit in well in Park City, but uh, Imagine, though, if it wasn't just that you didn't like the cold because you didn't have to deal with snow or, or uh, heavy clothing, but, but that you had a disease where if you were exposed to cold, that your body attacked its own red blood cells. And in doing so, produced blue fingers and toes. In doing so, produced chronic anemia, chronic fatigue. Uh, and even to the point of in doing so, caused you to have thrombosis, blood clots, potentially strokes, pulmonary embolisms. This is called cold agglutinin disease. It affects 6,000 people in the United States, so it's an ultra-orphan uh, disease with no approved therapy. This is one of the diseases we hope to treat with our lead molecule and hope to address uh, a patient population that has been neglected. And your impression is that the industry generally is changing in such a way that smaller companies like yours can step into a space where big pharma is just not delivering? I think that's been the trend, you know, and, and Big Pharma recognizes that the innovation in biotechnology is happening in small companies. Companies like ours, as, as we mentioned, 17 people, uh, are focused on one thing all day, every day. And we've taken a bold risk to go into a biology space that no one has attempted before, a first-in-class agent. And I think that we're either going to win big or we're not. Mm -hmm. and, and so Pharma watches and waits to an extent and, uh, and hopes that, that we succeed. Stuart Smith, um, talk to us about, uh, yeah, you, Redflow. Redflow, um, yes, I'm Stuart Smith. I'm CEO of uh, Redflow from Australia. And essentially, we have the world's smallest flow battery. Um, Simon mentioned earlier on about um, energy storage in, um, a, a, as, as a whole. Um, but we have the smallest flow battery, which we already have in market, and we're already uh, manufacturing them. Flow batteries, quickly tell us, okay, explain. Okay, so there's some significant differences, and the reason for the uh, advantages of a small one are significant. Um, our battery has uh, certain uh, features and characteristics which other batteries simply don't have. Um, some examples of those, um, it charges and discharges 100% day in and day out of all of its energy. Uh, one of the key features is that it's fully recyclable. Um, it's made from recyclable plastic, uh, even the heart of any battery is the electrode. Even our electrode is made of plastic as well. Um, it tolerates heat, humidity, harsh environments better than any other product that's available at the moment. Um, it's intrinsically safe. Uh, it does not need any fire suppression, any thermal management. Um, it's essentially a um, salt solution in the, in the electrolyte. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, the, key, the key advantage that it, is, that, that it has is, the, um, is that it's small. Uh, it's 33 inches, 32 inches. We have one outside. People are welcome to take a look at it. Um, and this allows us to now go into markets which other flow batteries traditionally have not been able to enter. Yeah, I mean, we, there's a big issue I know going on in Africa at the moment, which is to do with uh, the idea of bypassing the grid. The grids are so terrible in Africa that providing solar solutions to uh, communities there or, or even households there is very hard. And obviously, battery technology is going to be key to changing that around. And as you say, you provide a solution which works in hot climates especially, right? Correct, yes. We've, we've currently got harsh environment trials going on at the moment. They're all um, successful, um, including in Africa. Um, I was in Africa two weeks ago, so uh, that is actually happening. It's installed. It's on the ground. Uh, we've also got in Central America and also in Asia, all climates which um, uh, traditional batteries don't operate very well in without some kind of um, uh, management, uh, you know, thermal management, either cooling or, or heating. Okay, we've got some um, solutions now coming up to uh, different aspects, different aspects to the challenge of internet security, authentication, and so on. Shall I uh, start with you, David Schoenberger, certain sake? Sure, at the heart and foundation of what we do at CertainSafe is protect data. 
and we do it in such a way that in the eventuality that there is a breach into a system of some sort, a malicious attack, and a hacker tries to steal data, the data that they're going to take is not discernible with any or they don't even know what to do with it. There's no real value to the data. So we have a process where we micro-encrypt and micro-tokenize this data. And I can explain it you know, out in the halls later. But we're not about protecting you from someone coming in. We, we anticipate that you have great firewalls and great intrusion protection. So we're not that kind of a company. We're at the heart of the data. What happens to the data itself? And this foundation has led us to what I think is super exciting and I'm very passionate about, is protecting communications that leave one device with a command that some receiving device needs to execute upon. The Internet of Things, imagine, imagine my Fitbit communicating with my smartphone, the garage door opener to the garage, the key fob to the car, or some satellite instruction communicating to an unmanned vehicle, maybe a drone. We have created a way that we're no longer communicating commands, and we're not even communicating encrypted commands. We're taking out the, the command from the equation, but allowing the two sides to communicate for the first time without real data ever going across a transmission. Again, we don't care about the transmission. We're not trying to secure the way in which these devices communicate. We're just securing what they communicate. And so we're super excited about it. And yes, by golly, talk to me. We'll talk more about this at length. You were talking about seven levels of encryption or something like that, right? I mean, this is complex. Of, of not encryption per se, but in addition to encryption, multiple layers of data points that make this data undiscernible. It means that when we send a command, it's instantly obsolete. Uh, someone, a man in the middle, if they're grabbing data out of the air, they can never replicate the data. It can never be used. They'll never even know what was communicated in the stream of, of data. Sean, valid soft. Yeah, so uh, I think the security theme is, is uh, an underlying one here, so I'm glad to say we're in the right business. Um, Validsoft, at its core, is looking at making transactions and security around transactions a lot simpler. And we do that through a combination of a very robust, what's called a user authentication platform, and those of you that are familiar with the classic term of digital identity components, we leverage that data on top of a very robust voice biometrics engine. So if you think of the way in which you look at multi-factor authentication, we are leveraging a very high-powered proprietary software platform residing in the cloud that can touch virtually any transaction point that that customer interfaces with. So while today we do a lot of business in and around transactions, say with banks or enterprises and replacing pins and passwords and finding bad guys through deflecting that fraud channel, our vision is where the IoT of things, if you will, is going to continue to morph into having a persona that follows you and understands you. And furthermore, looking at where the developing world is going to continue to need services where authentication, regardless of language, regardless of education, is important. Mm -hmm. So having that capability to leverage that metadata that you can draw off of that digital world on top of a voice biometrics engine uh, we believe is going to give us and continues to give us a very unique position in the marketplace today. And the voice biometrics, you can identify, for instance, if I'm speaking on the phone, I can be identified. That doesn't hide my identity vocally, right? And if I have a cold, if I become a baritone instead of a tenor, I don't know. I mean, that, that's not going to change, right? Who I am is somehow yeah, hardwired into my voice. It's a great question. So I think one of the things we always get involved with when we talk about voice biometrics is your voice print is not a WAV file that we kind of layer over and say, okay, we have a match. My voice print is unique to me, whether I have a cold, whether I'm speaking in different tones, it's the energy through which I project. It's the physiology of my throat. It's how I actually communicate that's very unique to me. So to answer your question, it doesn't matter what channel, it doesn't matter how you're speaking, we're going to be able to identify you. Gino Pereira. Hello, Gino Pereira. I'm a CEO of a Next ID. Uh, we are a public company listed on NASDAQ. Uh, we trade under the symbol NXTD. And uh, NextID is a biometric and authentication and encryption company, funnily enough. And um, we have a little bit of uh, both of what these previous companies have, and we have some different spins on our own. But essentially, you know, we're in the business of making sure that only you have authorized access to information that is personal to you. 
and that it's protected in how that information is transmitted. And our device is a little bit more personal. So what we've done is we've developed the world's first real smart rocket. And this is called a rocket. And this is envisioned to be a replacement for the wallets that you carry in your pocket right now. So I don't know how many folks have, you know, some folks have really thin wallets and some have thick ones. Uh, but this can hold up to 10,000 pieces of data in here. And it's, you know, less than half an inch thick. And uh, how it works is you can put on credit cards, debit cards, loyalty cards. Uh, you can put your passwords on here, your medical information. And the reason why it's secure is not because uh, we're, you know, I'd like to think we're a little bit clever, but not because we're so much cleverer than everybody else. Uh, it's because this is not connected to anything. Nobody can hack this because it's not on a server, it's not on a cloud. It's your own personal vault that you carry with you and therefore all your information is protected. And if you lose it, there's nothing for anybody to get. The information is on a tamper-proof encrypted chip in the rocket, and you access it either with a voice biometric or with an alphanumeric pin, uh, and only you have access to your information. And what you do is you select, if you want to use a barcode, it's used off the screen. If you wish to use a credit debit card, uh, you program that, you select the choice on the touch screen, and you have one single card that represents any card you wish to choose in this rocket, and you can take it and swipe it just like a regular credit card. So the information on here is there's no visible information other than your name and signature as to what your card number is. So nobody can take your card in the back of a restaurant and write, and write the number down. Furthermore, the information that's on the back of the card disappears after five minutes. So if you leave it behind, it's no good to anyone. So this is, um, you know, one of the things as we talk about uh, cybersecurity and everything else, that when you go back and you look at the basic statistics, 44% of known causes of identity theft are caused by a lost or stolen wallet or purse. It's the physical loss of a device. Recently, there was a study uh, out about um, payments on smartphones. And, you know, certain folks have uh, concerns about payments on smartphones. And, uh, you know, 20% of people thought that, well, they were concerned because they join public networks and that's an open door for hackers to come in potentially. But fully another 20% were concerned because they could lose their phone. So physical loss is often something that we neglect, that we don't look at closely enough. Anyone wants to ask any questions, please step to the middle. Uh, we have one already. Oh, yeah. Hi, yeah. Richard. All right, full disclosure, I've known Sean for a long time, and yeah. I have a tremendous respect for his intellectual ability. But I'm going to put you on the spot with a question, because oh, no. you fascinated me when you said it was a voice print technology. Does it make a difference what language I'm speaking? No, it does not. I mean, our so, so I, can, I can speak German one time, I can speak Farsi another time, and try English another time, and it's still works. So we, we approach biometric analysis in two different ways. We do it in a classic way, which is text dependent, which everybody is thinking of as replacing your PIN and password, right? There's another side of the fence, which is text independent, which is more of a passive way that we analyze audio. And in the passive way that we analyze audio, the example you just gave is an example we could, irrespective of language, be able to identify that user customer. All right, and so I'm sure you've thought of applications where an individual may be in a threatening or non-friendly environment? Uh, we have. Um, I think that there's, uh, you, I think you're starting to see kind of an element of where, if you're going down the road of talking about voice stress and, and those comparisons, and, and that type of element, you know, yeah, we think it's going in that direction. I think the technology is a few years off mm -hmm. till you're going to be able to see something that can identify mood or more or less, you know, what is your mental state while you're speaking this? But where we're looking at at this moment is kind of just addressing a core, making sure the person who is attempting to access is that person, regardless of language, regardless of access point. Wow. Thank you. Anyone else? On the biopharma, can you talk a little bit about the methodologies or the technologies that allow you to economically be viable for uh, populations as small as 6,000? Sure, it's a great question. You know, I think there were, for a long time in the industry, the thinking was that you had to address blockbuster indications like 
high blood pressure, hypertension, things like that. Uh, recently, there have been great successes in, in addressing orphan drug therapeutics for small populations. Mm -hmm. I think what's very important is to leverage the, the things that have been commoditized in our business. Our drug is a monoclonal antibody. It's the processes to produce those are very well understood. We don't need to build that infrastructure. We can outsource that. And then I think it's a question of doing smart clinical studies and cost-effective clinical trials to get to an endpoint that's quick and that's clear and definitive so that you can make those decisions then to move forward. And then I think it becomes, lastly, once you have a drug that you've proven works, that you've, again, developed in a cost-effective way, that you then get in front of payers and, and insurance providers and reimbursement agencies to say, there's a reason that you know, we should be able to get this drug to patients. There's a reason that we should come up with the right cost structure to do that. And I think there is an openness in the industry towards that, because when you demonstrate in a disease like cold agglutinin disease, the people are dying in, with the absence of a therapy, that no matter how small the population, there is much more openness now to, to supporting those patients. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Question about the smart wallet. Even the US is finally doing chip and pin cards. Do you have a solution for that? Because hopefully the swipe card is dead in two years. People have invested in kickstarting coin, have got a unit that they now can't use for their new credit cards. How do you stop yourself being completely useless by the time I get it? Right, so our uh, technology platform is very flexible. So uh, different from COIN, which uses a particular technology, uh, our technology is much more similar to uh, what Samsung Pay is that's being used today. So we're currently uh, working with Visa, MasterCard, American Express to, um, to have a tokenization system because we can pass tokens uh, on our card. So the advantage of using a Wacky card or Samsung Pay, for instance, uh, is that you can, use, you, you can use multiple cards, not just carry many cards with DMV on them, but you can use them also at more point-of-sale terminals. So, you know, the cost of EMV migration in the U.S. is about $8 billion, and there's about 12 million point-of-sale terminals in the United States. I think the estimates are there might be about 2 to 3 million of those that are EMV capable today. And this, by the way, this is after October 1st, when everybody's supposed to have an EMV terminal. So there's an awful lot of merchant friction. Some merchants are not going to change over because they don't want to spend the money. They're, they perceive their fraud risk to be relatively low. Um, so the beauty is we can actually take tokenization and the same level of EMV equivalent uh, protection and make those transactions over most of those 12 million point-of-sale terminals that are out there today. Question, Stuart, I'm in a house in Southern California, let's say a family home, um, and I get a reasonable amount of sunshine because it's Southern California. How much, how big is the battery I'm gonna need in my roof to keep me, my AC working through the night when, uh, right. when the sun goes down? Yep, uh, that, uh, and, and that's very relevant to the, to the, to the battery that we have. Um, it depends on how much, how much your house consumes, sure. but assuming it's um, relatively efficient and based on Australian average household use, it's about 24 kilowatt hours a day. So if you've got the solar to actually generate sufficient for your use in the house, as well as put it into a battery, one battery at 10 kilowatt hours, again, depending on your load profile, should, should, be, should be sufficient. And one battery is what? One battery is uh, 33 inches, 32 inches, 16, it's small. But it's not, it, the fact that it's small is, is fantastic because there's no, nothing out like there, um, nothing like it out there. But what is also, what it can also be done is it's fully scalable. So, you know, when Simon referred to having containers underneath um, um, tra transmission lines, that can also be done. They just get, um, uh, they can be connected up in series and in parallel. And in fact, we're doing our first delivery of our first container, <coughs> excuse me, in, um, in the next month, um, which is a 20 foot shipping container, 48 batteries in, we can go up to 60, and that can provide um, large scale storage as well. So it's, it's, yeah, for your house, back to your question, <laughs> depending on probably your house would need two, um, but the average house, maybe, uh, maybe one should, should suffice, but it's totally load dependent. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we obviously, uh, IP theft is a, is a big theme, and I, I'm gonna throw it to the, you know, the guys here. We, I go to you know, RSA conferences in the past, and it seems like there's a, a gigantic room full of people offering me um, firewalls, um, none of which obviously work 
that well, given that the entire conference seems to have been hacked when I arrived. But I mean, is there a, is there a sense that we're onto a second generation here with your stuff? I mean, are we, yeah. you know, as an industry, are we now? Are you are you in a field of many where you feel more confident that, that all of these endless stories that we get from the corporate world are going to be? I don't know there's there's new there's new tools if you like to mitigate that challenge. There are new tools, and it's. Thankfully, because of, and, and this, I don't mean it this way, but because so much fraud has occurred, everyone is so hypersensitive about preventing this that we have a perfect opportunity to complement many of these other technologies. Authentication is a key part of security. Firewalls and, and perimeter protection, absolute must. But what about the actual piece of data? And so this complementary package, this one, two, three, four punch, even if you're talking about it, because what, we, what the idea is is to take a piece of data and secure it, but not secure it into oblivion, but secure it to the point of, of proper accessibility. Because what we know about most sensitive data is that a company or an individual, that very most important thing, they probably need to use it on a regular basis and maybe even in a real-time basis. So preserving that accessibility is a critical factor. All these other steps have to be there in addition, but if we can protect that actual piece of data, make it accessible, be able to send a command with this type of data as a substitute, boy, we've got, we're onto something. Sean? You know, I, I always kind of think about it, and, and I, I think that's an excellent, excellent, excellent explanation, but I look at it in much simpler terms. I wonder how many breaches could have been stopped if the pin or password had some sort of biometric layer attached to it. Um, if, let's say, a voice biometric layer was enabled so that that person who stole a potential or a employee's data or, excuse me, pin and password and access to database could have been stopped cold because they weren't able to go through because their voice print didn't match. So from our perspective, we look at it at the point of access mm -hmm. and being able to shut it down at that point mm -hmm. as being a major, major factor. Yep. Okay, my thanks to you all. These are our five fire starts for the uh, second session. Thank you very much for listening.